This is Mark chapter 16. Afterward, he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So then, after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was raised up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Today we're celebrating the ascension of Jesus. And I would say that that's probably the most poorly taught or least taught things in the Christian experience. The Son of Man is seated in heaven. I love the TV show Monk. And the reason I like the show TV show Monk, uh, which I believe has been seen all over the world now, so... The TV show Monk is about a a detective who has obsessive compulsive disorder. And the thing I always liked about Monk was at the beginning of the show, they show you the murder happening. They show you who did it. They show you how they did it. And so you're like, well, what's the mystery in this? The show was about how he solved the mystery. It wasn't about who did it. It was how he figured it out. And it, I found it fascinating. And I, I love that show. Well, today, I want to talk about the ascension, sort of like Monk. I'm going to show you the end from the beginning. And we're going to look at this passage from Acts, but we're going to look at it backwards. And we're going to start from heaven's perspective. Because one of the biggest mistakes you can make in life is to have a human earthly perspective and interpret what God is doing through an earthly perspective. And when you have an earthly perspective, you will always miss it. And what's really interesting is that if you have a religious grid, you are going to miss what God is doing. And if you have a political grid, you are going to miss what God is doing. And both of these grids are in this passage. There's one, word, one title that Jesus uses for himself in scripture, more than any other. And that title is Son of Man. In the Gospels, Jesus refers to himself as Son of Man 81 times. You know, we've been studying these I am's in the last few weeks in the readings, the I am statements of Jesus. There are only a few of those. But Jesus says to his disciples and everyone teaching that he is the son of man 81 times. And from being a student of scripture and theology and reading lots of commentaries, the vast majority of people have no idea what he's talking about. You read commentaries and the commentators don't know what Jesus is talking about. But Jesus says, I am the son of man. And that's about Ascension Day. The son of man is about the Ascension. And the Ascension of Jesus, if you miss the Ascension of Jesus, you've missed it all. Because the earthly ministry and the cross, and the resurrection were about the ascension. 
I bet you've never heard that before. Everything in the kingdom is about the incarnation. Everything in the kingdom is about the incarnation. It's not about theology. It's not about the end times. It's about the incarnation. It's about God becoming flesh. As Eugene Peterson says beautifully, God became a man and moved into the neighborhood. So if you'll turn with me to Daniel chapter 7. Every time something happens in scripture, as John says in, the, in one of his epistles, there are two or three witnesses to everything that God does. What's amazing is that there are two or three witnesses to everything that God did in the Bible. And in many places, there's not only a witness of the historical event, there's God's perspective in heaven of the event. And that is astounding. So in Revelation, we have Christmas described from heaven's point of view. In Revelation chapters 11 and 12, wow. And here, we have the ascension of Jesus. So as you remember from that reading in Acts, it ends with Jesus stepping into a cloud. Well, listen to this. Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him, and there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, which shall not be destroyed. And I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit, in the midst of my body, and the visions of my head troubled me, I came near unto one of them that stood by and asked him the truth of all these things. And so he told me and made me know the interpretation of the things. These great beasts, which are four, are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. So we saw Jesus step into a cloud. And here in Daniel, Daniel sees Jesus step out of the cloud on the other side. The end from the beginning. And what happens? Jesus, in a few, I, I won't go into the Daniel passage, but basically there's a great triumph that happens over a beast. Jesus defeated the beast on the cross. He came out of the tomb. And then once that work was completed, that victory, that perfect, complete, overwhelming, total victory over all of his enemies in every way, shape, and form. Then he goes into heaven. And he receives the kingdom. You know, as, as you know, our calling is to raise up an army of artists who will build Jesus a throne in the earth. Another word for throne is dominion. The rule and reign and jurisdiction of the king. So Jesus, 81 times in his ministry, refers to this passage, this verse, one like a son of man comes with the clouds of heaven and receives the kingdom from the ancient of days. And if you don't have a kingdom perspective, you'll miss it. The whole point 
of everything that Jesus did was to establish a kingdom, not a religion. A kingdom of every people, nation, and language that would serve him. They will not pass away. That will only increase and never decrease. So let's, just like Monk, let's go back now to Acts, to the other side of that cloud. If this was a movie, we'd have a fade out. Acts chapter 1, verse 11. So all of a sudden, Jesus steps into a cloud and he disappears. And these disciples have never seen anything like this before. The Son of Man has stepped into a cloud. And so all of a sudden, there are two men who appear. Now, this is where we have to lay aside our, our tendency to interpret before observing. You will miss what's in the Bible if you interpret first and then observe. Now, all of you, and I showed, I had a beautiful painting that I showed here full of angels. There are no angels in this picture. Scripture says there were two men in white. Two men. I, I read a really interesting thing this week that said maybe those two men were Moses and Elijah. Because they're the only people in the old covenant who had mysterious deaths like this vanished. And these two men said, Jesus is coming back and he's going to come back just the way he left in the clouds of heaven. But, but just before this, Jesus says, you are to go to the whole earth and preach. Why? Because we know on the other side of the cloud, the son of man is seated in heaven. And on the other side of the cloud, it says that Jesus is going to receive every language, nation, people, and they're going to become part of his kingdom. So they were given the job to go to the whole earth and tell them that the kingdom is being established. Now let's back up just a little bit. Jesus rises from the dead. He spends 40 days with them after he rose from the dead. And he teaches them in great detail, explains to them what's happened and what's going to happen. And what is the very last question his disciples ask him? They know that something's about to happen. They've gone up to the Mount of Olives. They know something is going on. And what do they ask him? They ask him, well, so now is Israel going, are you going to be the king? And are you going to overthrow the Romans? And are you going to give us our political victory and restore the kingdom to Israel so we can be kings over the whole earth? That's what he's asking. They ask him. And Jesus knows that he's going through a cloud to receive every kingdom, every language, every nation, every people. And they're still making Israel an idol. They spend 40 days after the resurrection with Jesus, and they still didn't get it. And Jesus doesn't answer their question. I find that interesting. He doesn't even bother answering their question at this point. He just says, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes. And you will be my witnesses to me in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. It's not about your little thing, your earthly perspective. It's not about your nation. It's not about your party. It's not about your, your group, your thing, what you care about. 
what you think Jesus cares about, but you really care about, and you baptize. No. It's about the kingdom, the king and the kingdom. And the king and the kingdom is about the incarnation, God in the flesh. God in the flesh. And what is God in the flesh about? Filling you with the Holy Spirit. And if we back up a little bit more, it says, wait for the promise of the Father. Because John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost and with power. God became a man. God became a man to build a temple not made with hands. God became a man so that you would be temples of the Holy Ghost and be filled with power from on high so that you would be witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. I think that's all of us. I think we are all part of the uttermost parts of the earth. We are the kingdom. The Son of Man is seated in heaven. So why is this important? Well, here's the first part that's really important. It says Jesus is coming back. And when Jesus comes back, he's going to judge the earth. Do you know why this is important? Because God is going to, all throughout the Old Covenant, it's said, God was going to judge the earth. There's only one way for God to completely judge the earth with equity. And that is for God to become a human being and submit to creation. So God submitted to creation. God, who is out of time, came into time. Time is like the atmosphere of the earth. You know, outside the atmosphere of the earth, we can't live. Inside the atmosphere of the earth, we are able to live. Well, time is like that. We are inside a created thing. And that created thing is fallen. You know, when you feel like you are, you know, time is futile, you know, time is flying. That's part of the fallenness of time. Well, God took on flesh became the son of man and entered into time. Submitted to time. Submitted to the brokenness of humanity. Submitted to the brokenness of the earth. Submitted to an unjust religious system. Submitted to an unjust legal system. Submitted to an unjust political system and an unjust economic system. He came under all of that. So when he comes to judge the earth, he is going to judge with equity. He is going to judge with knowledge. He is going to judge as one who has been judged himself. The son of man is seated in heaven. The second reason that's important is because he ever lives above. For me to intercede, as Charles Wesley said, he is seated at the right hand of the Father. And whenever you and I are in a, in a bind, whenever we are under this unjust system, he holds up his hands and his feet before the Father. And he says, see my hands, see my feet, see my side. They just did an incredible sculpture based on the images um, that they can get from the Shroud of Turin. Remember last week I said that there were 613 laws in the Old Testament? Well, they estimate that there's 
roughly that many uh, strikes on the body from that they could that they could discern. He took one blow for every law. Wow. And that body, that body is in heaven. A physical body, a human body is in heaven. Do you get this? This is why Daniel was perplexed and troubled because he's in a spiritual realm and out of in the spiritual realm, a human being walks out of the cloud. A human being with bruises and wounds and receives all things. There's a human being in heaven standing before the throne for you today. And of course, the greatest thing of all, because a human being in heaven intercedes for us. Remember when I taught on spirit and in truth? Now, God is spirit, and we cannot worship God as human beings. We can't give glory to God because we are a different species, so to speak. We're a different kind of being. Well, God became a man to make that no longer a problem. And Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit. And then he went back up to heaven. And he bridged the gap. N.T. Wright talks about this quite a bit in, in some of his books. And he, he talks about how in the old covenant, heaven and earth met at the te temple in Jerusalem. And Jesus, of course, one of the things that got him crucified was he said, the son of man will destroy this temple and in three days raise it up again the son of man. And he, he took a building made of rocks and he replaced it with his own body. He became that place where heaven and earth meet. And whenever we encounter him, we're meeting heaven and earth. And then he said, I will fill you with the Holy Spirit. I will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And we'll talk about that next week. It's all pointing toward that day. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses. God became a man, the son of man, the son of man. And the son of man is seated in heaven. The son of man is seated in heaven and he's coming back. All of it, all of it matters. It wasn't just a way to get the body out of the picture, to explain away why he wasn't around anymore. No, it was the whole point. He came so that he could re-enter heaven. And he said it 81 times in his life. I'm going back and I'm going to receive the kingdom from the ancient of days. And I'm going to rule and reign over the earth. God is restoring the kingdom. You know, we are in a reforming time right now. And I hate to use that word because we, we've got this grid from the 16th century. So people think when, and people misinterpret this, you know, God gave lots of people words about a reformation coming. So the first thing people did was they started running around tearing things down again. That's not what God is doing. Reforming is changing the shape. God is reforming. God is taking away all of the structures from the Roman Empire. 
And if you don't think you be, you have them, let me tell you something. The biggest one is this top-down hierarchy all over the place. That's not New Testament. That's Roman Empire. God's taking it away. God's taking away all the Greek philosophy. Lord said, when, I, when I'm done taking the Greek philosophy and the Roman hierarchy out of the church, there's going to be something incredible unleashed in the earth. The greatest prosperity in human history is about to release, be released. When we get the kingdom, when we get a kingdom perspective, that Jesus is the king. He is the son of man. He is seated at the right hand of the father. He is seated because his work is finished. And we've been entrusted. But we can't do it on our own. Just like we heard for the last two weeks, apart from me, you can do nothing. The king is on the throne. The kingdom is on the move. And he is ruling and reigning. And if he is ruling and reigning, we are seated with him in heavenly places, above all rule and authority. It is finished. We are seated with him and he is in us and we are in him. When we are attached to him, wow, wow. And all things are possible. The son of man is seated in heaven. No matter what you face this week, remember that the son of man is seated in heavenly places and he is in you and you are in him. And because he is in you, you are seated with him in heavenly places as well. Above all rule and authority over wars and rumors of wars, and any noise that the world, the flesh, and the devil raises up to shake you, you have inherited an unshakable kingdom. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen.